Greetings, everyone, and welcome again to Community Chats. Uh, for today, Wednesday, June 10th, my name is Anthony Saracusa, the Director of Community Engagement at the University of Mississippi. And I am joined, as always, by my inimitable colleagues, Aaron Pizer Oath and Jody Holland. And these chats, community chats, are regular conversations that we have with individuals in the Lafayette Oxford University community who are committed to making life better for people in our region. We come to you every week, twice a week, on Wednesdays and Fridays from 12 noon to 12.30. And our goal here is to allow these individuals who are making a positive difference in our community to tell their own stories in their own words. How did they come to be involved in this work? What is that work and what are their visions for the future? Would you like to be interviewed on the show or do you know somebody who would? Please be in touch with us. Send us a direct message on Facebook or you can hit us up on email at engaged at oldmiss.edu. I say every week and it is not just a perfunctory item. It is very important to name that this is a joint initiative with our friends at the Lafayette Oxford Foundation for Tomorrow, LOFT. They have just concluded um, their granting cycle for the month of May and continue to provide tremendous support to dozens of nonprofits across our region. And so we are grateful to Loft and for their partnership in the Community Chats initiative. Today, we are so happy to welcome to our show, Aaron Smith of CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates of Lafayette County. And we just could not be more delighted to hear from you, Aaron, today and about all the good work you're doing. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Well, let's jump right into it. We want to hear from you. And so can you get us started just by sharing a little bit about where did you grow up and what path did you take here to the Lafayette Oxford community? Absolutely. So I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, um, spent a majority of my life there until about the 10th grade. And then I moved to Yazoo City, um, graduated from Manchester Academy. Um, from there, I moved to Oxford and I have not left. Um, so I went to the University of Mississippi from 2002 to 2006. Um, Started off on what I thought I was passionate about, um, and that was the restaurant industry. Um, along the way, I've opened a restaurant, sold a restaurant, um, and then, you know, I, I was a member of Cap Alpha Theta Sorority when I was at the university, and their national philanthropy is CASA, and so that's how I found out about CASA and what, you, what they do. Um, but, you know, you can't be a volunteer until you turn 21, which is typically when you graduate college, and so um, at that point, wasn't, a, wasn't in a place in my life where I could be a volunteer. Um, the timing wasn't right. And so um, in about 2009, um, I looked into becoming a volunteer um, for CASA, but there were no programs in the northern part of the state. Um, there were actually no programs in any part of the state except for the southern part, um, which is still that way today. Um, and so the closest program was in Memphis, Shelby County. Um, and so that's what I did. I became a volunteer um, in Memphis, Shelby County. I did that for four years. I would drive to visit my children um, an hour, sometimes a little further away, drive there for court cases. Um, and about four years afterwards, I said, you know, I really want to start a program here. Um, so about 2017, I felt like I was at a point in my life where I could start that program. And so I began the footwork to, to start it. And so um, a little bit about CASAs, we are a part of a national organization. Um, and so, you know, what it basically takes is someone who's willing um, and ready to start a program. And I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of footwork, but um, it just takes someone who's committed about um, the mission of the national organization about children. Uh, and so that's kind of how, how I got to this place. Um, like I said, I've been in Oxford uh, since 2002. Um, my, my family lives in Memphis and in Collierville, Tennessee. Um, I live here with my two dogs. Um, in my free time, I enjoy coaching seven and eight year old boys basketball. Uh, I'm also a board member for the Chamber of Commerce. I volunteer whenever I can. Uh, I've been an ambassador for the Chamber for the last uh, five, six years. Um, and then I'm also finishing up my Master's of Science in Nonprofit Administration at LSU right now. So I'll be done with that in um, August. Yeah, so it's almost done. It's, it's mm -hmm. flown by. Um, but, you know, I, I guess uh, at the end of the day, what I enjoy most um, is just giving back to my community. So anytime that I can give back to the Little Fayette Oxford community, um, I, I like to do that. And I'm always one to put others before myself. And, um, and so that's just what I try to live by. And um, I think that's really what's led me to really start this program, um, to be honest. And, um, you know, I, I can go into now about how the program began or, um, you know, we can get to that later on in the show if you'd like. 
Yeah, I think Jody's got the next question. That's a perfect segue. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a great segue. And you kind of told us, you know, how you kind of got into this position, but I mean, you founded it here. I'm curious about, you know, for a lot of people who may be watching this, like, oh, she just woke up, she decided she's going to start a program in, in, in Oxford. It's, it's more difficult than that, I want to say. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> you that process. I mean, you just didn't land this position. You created it. So take yeah. us through that process. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, one child in CPS, so Child Protection Services, you'll hear me refer to CPS a lot just because it's easier to say. Um, one child in state custody is too many. So that's one child in foster care is too many. Um, and, you know, so I saw a need here. You know, I, I will tell anybody that I come encounter with, any group that I speak to, um, you know, that I feel like Oxford is a, it's, it's a great community to live in. We have a great university. I think we are a wealthy community. Um, but I also think that a lot of people in the community have blinders up to the fact that child abuse is going on around them, neglect is going on around them, and it, it could easily just be happening next door to you. And so I saw a need, and that's really how it started. I found something that I was incredibly passionate about by being a volunteer in Memphis, um, and then just started, I said, you know, I found the right people to, to kind of help me um, get in with, because essentially you have to start with the youth court judge, and if that youth court judge has buy-in and believes in you, then you can begin the footwork to start the program. And so that's really where it started. And to be honest, when I planned to start the program, I never planned to be employed by the program. Um, I guess I thought that I was just gonna serve on the board or serve as the board president <laughs> for the rest of my life. I knew this was gonna be my baby, but didn't know that um, I would be employed because to be quite honest with you, um, I thought there might be more people out there that were more um, fit for the role. Um, you know, I didn't have experience in nonprofit. Um, I didn't know how to run a nonprofit. I had a lot of experience in leadership, but didn't know how to run a nonprofit. And so, um, you know, we, we started uh, the board organized in July 2017. Um, time went by. Um, National CASA is very big that you need to have a paid employee in a role and it shouldn't be volunteer run. Now, while we are, the heart of our organization are, is volunteers, um, you need to have someone that is paid to, to run the program. And so um, March, so we got our nonprofit status in uh, February of 2018. March of 2018, uh, my board did ask me to step down as president and serve as interim director. Um, I was working a full-time job at that point. Um, but along the way, I, I, I really realized that this is what I'm supposed to do in life. This is what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and we had not even had it. We hadn't started cases yet, didn't have any volunteers yet. But I just found that this is something that I'm really, really passionate about. And so um, I took the role as the part-time interim director. Um, they offered me the full-time role in September of 2018. And so here I am today. And, um, you know, since then, I, I have just spent a majority of my time educating uh, the community. Because as many, unless you came from somewhere or you, you have a friend or family member that might know about CASA, you likely don't know because there is there there's no presence of CASA in this part of the state. Um, we have six programs in the entire state out of 82 counties. Six. That's mm -hmm. it. And and they're all for the most part um, in on the coast. So Jackson County, Harrison County, Hancock County, um, and then we move over to Adams County, and we also we do have one in Warren County as well. And then it's us. So we're talking about, you know, you know, 5,000 children that, that come into custody every year. So we're talking about sometimes we could have 10,000 kids in custody because as you, you probably are aware, just from common sense, children don't just go out of custody. They don't come in and go out. They stay, typically they stay from a minimum of six months, sometimes up to three years. And so, um, you know, at any given time, we could have that many in state custody. And so... I just, you know, I wanted to do something to impact these children that are the most vulnerable children in our community. These are the ones that don't have anybody fighting for them. And if you've ever talked to someone who has gone through the adoption process or gone through the foster care um, fostering process or know someone that has, they tell you what a struggle it is and they tell you that they don't have, it's so hard to get somebody to speak up on their behalf. And so and that's really, that is what CASA's mission is. Our mission is to advocate for every child that has been abused or neglected and has come into state custody to make sure that they're in a safe and permanent home. And so we assign um, volunteers to every case um, as long as we have volunteers available. And that's just, that's how we function. And so along the way, you know, I have, I've grown to learn a lot about nonprofit organizations. I've grown to learn a lot about funding, a lot about grant writing. <laughs> 
Um, which really, I mean, takes me back to why I started, I started to get my master's because I needed to learn more. I needed to educate myself more because like I said, I did not, when I first started this, I didn't think that I was the right fit because I thought there were more people that were better fit, better fit for the role than me. That was just simply because I didn't have the background or the education to run a nonprofit. So, um, you know, here I am now, and um, I, I will say I will probably be here till I'm old and gray, um, <laughs> God willing, but uh, that, that's really how I got to, to the position that I'm in at this point. Great, thanks for sharing that. Uh -huh. yeah. So Erin, you mentioned that CASA is a national organization. Some people are familiar with it, but maybe everyone doesn't know exactly what CASA does. So can you just tell us a little bit about the mission and how you work with CPS and- Sure, sure. The work that you uh, do. Yeah. Um, so, uh, CASA, like I said, is a national organization. There are a little over 900 programs across the United States, um, which, you know, it's great on one hand, but also we need more. We need more programs in every state. We need more programs in, um, just all over the place. And so we need more volunteers. And so what, what we do is we advocate for the best interest of abused and neglected children in the courts. And so what does that mean? That's, you know, that's our our tagline, I guess you could not tagline, but that's just what we tell people. And so we recruit and supervise, uh, recruit and train and supervise volunteers. They go through a 30 hour pre-service training. At, at that point, they are sworn in by the youth court judge. Once they're sworn in by the youth court judge, they're assigned to court cases, just like social workers, just like guardian ad litems. And they, they advocate for those children. And so typically volunteers um, are assigned to one case at a time. They might be assigned to two cases at a time if we're really in, in desperate need, never more than two. And so that's something that we really focus on is that a CASA volunteer is spending more time on a case than the average person. And so we work very hand in hand with CPS. We work really, really closely with the guardian light on. And so we are the three parties that bring recommendations to the youth court to decide the future of these children. So whether that is um, reunification with the parent, whether that is um, changing the plan to adoption, whether that's something as simple as increasing visitation. Um, that is our role. And the youth court judge here, you know, he tells me often, he's like, I don't know what I did before I had a CASA program. And, you know, and CPS would tell you the same is, you know, because we can alleviate some of that stress because, you know, they are, they are overburdened. And, you know, you, they own that they have so many cases. And there's, there's only so much time in a day to be able to spend with these children. And so where we come in is we're able to also spend time with children and communicate back what we've found or what we have known, what we've recognized. Um, and we all work together. You know, at the end of the day, it's about the child and what, what is best for this child. That does not mean that we're always going to agree on everything. And that's okay. You know, I mean, it's, it, these are volunteers that are spending, you know, at, at minimum once a week with these children um and and so they might see things that the the caseworker might see something different and so you know the idea is that we are all, all on the same page but it's not always going to be that way but we continue to work together and, and be able to provide resources for these children um resources that these children didn't have before um not because cps couldn't provide those re resources but the the time is so limited um on how much time they can spend on each case and so, you know, when it comes to National CASA, you know, there's some programs that serve under an umbrella. So they could serve under an umbrella like United Way, or they might serve under an umbrella like the Exchange, the Family Exchange Club. Um, we are our own individual nonprofit organization. Um, we have guidelines and um, standards that we have to follow through National CASA. Um, and and it, we work really closely with other programs. We hold conferences, trainings, et cetera. Um, the training is uh, the same across the board. So it's not like a program here is learning something different than a program in Texas. Um, but that's that's really how how we kind of um, all work together as one big organization. Wow, that is so amazing. And your your level of knowledge about how this works too. I know you were saying earlier, I feel like I need to develop more skills in a, through your master's, but you clearly have developed so much insight and knowledge about how this process works. And that's testament that. to your commitment and and our children are better off for it. So I know you mentioned that, I think if I got this right, you're a one person staff right now at Casa Lafayette. I, I, so I was, um, yeah. So actually I hired someone um, March, the, well, she started March the, um, the set, the third, second, <laughs> sorry. And um, bless her heart, she was with us for eight days. And then we went on um, quarantine 
but I, yeah, so I'm a two person staff now. Um, I do have a volunteer coordinator um, who actually came from CPS. Um, she's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and I, I will sit here and say this now, like she, I could not make it without her. So her role is to um, supervise all the volunteers, train them. Um, and then she also supervises cases as well. And so since she came in after we'd already been assigned to some cases, um, you know, we kind of split the, we split the roles of I'll supervise these, you supervise those. Um, but yeah, so we, we're a two person show right now. I definitely planning um, to expand our staff, our program, um, you know, in the very near future. Um, so I do have, there's two of us now and I'm, I'm so, <laughs> I'm so thankful. I was telling her the other day, I was like, I don't know what I did without you before. So. Perfect. Yeah. It takes a team to do big work like this. <laughs> So you mentioned that you wanted to expand your program. Tell us specifically, right now you have one program or multiple programs. What, what all is, is involved in the work? And then also in this question, I want you to highlight programming is fundraising. And y'all, you guys have a big fundraiser. Talk about that too. Yeah. So uh, my, my vision when I started this program was to become a regional program at some point. Um, and so knowing that I needed to start in one place, ideally Lafayette County, because that's where I live. Um, I have good connections here. Um, I wanted to start here. I wanted to make sure this program could be sustainable. I needed to make sure that we could be supported, that we could attract the volunteer base that we needed to attract. Um, I needed to make sure that financially we were stable as well. Um, but in my vision, when I started was I wanted to expand. I wanted to be Lafayette. I wanted to expand into Lee County. Um, I wanted to expand into Pontotoc and I wanted to expand into Marshall. And that's still on my radar. Uh, ten year, if you're asking me, you know, like time frame, that's my 10 year goal is to be in all, all four of those counties. Um, currently, we are working to expand into Lee County. And I, I, originally, it probably would have been done by now had COVID not come along. But um, we are in the works for that. Um, you know, when, when I look at how we can better serve not just our community, but the children in the state of Mississippi, I look at where the most need is. Now, there's a need in every county. Don't get me wrong but the biggest need are those counties that I just mentioned. Um, Lee County has tremendous need for, um, for a CASA program. I've worked very closely with that judge there. Um, she's in full support of, of CASA coming there. And, and I'll be honest, a lot of times I have judges reach out to me and say, I wanna start a program, what do I need to do? And it's not that easy. It's not, this isn't as easy as just starting up a program, you know, doing a one day of service type thing. This is, I mean, there's a lot of legal ramifications around it. A lot of things you have to do because you are in court cases. I mean, you are, you are all in, I mean, you are as much in as an attorney is, as a CASA, I mean, as a caseworker is. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to it. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that you have the connections, you're able to fundraise there. Um, you want to make sure that people in Lafayette County know that they can still support Lafayette County or they can support the program as a whole. And so um, that is my, that's my big vision. Um, you know, I, I do plan for us to eventually change our name to Casa of North Mississippi to be able to encompass all four of those counties. Um, you know, while people can still support, you know, their own individual counties, um, that that's important to me. Um, so that is, that's my big goal. Um, and, and I'm hoping uh, in the coming months, we can, we can, you know, formally announce that, I guess, officially announce that. Um, I have said from the get-go, like I said, anytime I go to talk to someone, I'm very open about our plans because I don't want anyone to think like, we want, we want to collect your money, we want to fundraise, but these are our big plans. We have much bigger plans than just serving the children in Lafayette County. We will always serve them, and that's, that's very important. That's important from a local standpoint. That's important from a national standpoint that we're always serving the 100% uh, of the children in these counties before we move forward. And so, you know, but also in order to continue to function as a program here, um, we have to raise funds, you know, and we do, um, we do, we are about 40% grant funded through a, a federal grant. Um, and we do get funding from um, United Way, we get funding from Loft, um, we get funding from uh, Kappa Alpha Theta before they they left the University of Mississippi's campus um, held a held an a event called um, Theta Encore and so at that event they raised money that before the local program existed they gave to the national organization so when this program came along they started splitting the funds well since they left um, uh, the Panhellenic Council took over the event and it, I, I'm telling y'all I never expected it. Um, I really thought that, that was just going to be funding that we lost and we'd have to make up somewhere else. And so 
this is the last year was the first year they took it over and they raised over $120,000 and donated it to oh. us. And, and they changed the name to Casa Encore and, and plan to continue it in our name for us to be the beneficiary, which is so amazing because not, you know, a lot of our volunteers, I mean, they range from 21. They range, I think my oldest one is um, almost 80. And, wow. you know, it's, it's incredible because we get so people have heard about Casa. They've heard about Casa through the, through Greek life, really, um, prior to our existence. And, um, you know, at that point, they didn't really know what we did. And so now we're actually here. And so we can tell them what we do. And then we have, um, you know, members of the Greek community that are actually volunteers. And so it really just, it's kind of coming full circle. And so they're a big fundraiser for, I mean, they're a big contributor for us. Um, and then we also, uh, we do have a, a grant with National Casa as well. And then the rest of it comes from individual donations and our fundraising events, which we have two main fundraising events. One is our Casa Superhero Run, which is typically held um, the last Saturday of March. Um, as you can imagine, that was not held this year. Um, it has been rescheduled for October 31st. And um, Aaron and I were talking prior to this that I, I couldn't have thought of a better date to reschedule a superhero event rather than Halloween. I mean, everybody <laughs> always dresses up anyway. And so I think it's perfect. And it's on a Saturday. And so why not get your exercise before you go get all that candy? So it'll be tentatively <laughs> still being um, planned to be held in person. Um, and it's at Avent Park um, at eight o'clock. It's a 5k and a kids fun run. Um, and then our other annual event is our Casablanca New Year's Eve Gala, which is held at the Powerhouse, obviously on December 31st. Um, and that's obviously still being planned as well. Um, and that we had a, last year was our first year and it was a great turnout. It was so much fun. You know, there's not really a lot to do in Oxford on New Year's. And so we want to give people a reason to stay and save their money. And why not give it to an organization that gives back to the community and helps kids that, that really need the help. So. That's great. Great. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I remember the first time I met you, Erin, and just walking away saying, here's someone that has big ideas and knows how to turn them into action. So thank, um, you. thank you so much for all of your work. I just find it inspiring to, to connect with you. I appreciate so it. what are some of the greatest challenges that you experience as a nonprofit, uh, either in this current moment, in this pandemic season, yeah. or in just day-to-day -day normal times? Yeah, I would say, you know, our biggest challenge right now, um, so it costs us about $1,400 to care for a child for a year. Now, when I say care for a child, that does not mean for us to take them in our custody, put them in our home and care for them. Um, but we provide resources for these children. And so whether that's um, clothing, emergency clothing, whether that is um, sometimes children's Medicaid might be inactive due to a lapse in coverage. And so if we need to help pay for doctor's appointments, summer, summer, uh, summer camp, after school care, um, there's a variety of different things that that we help pay for. Um, and so sometimes that can be more, sometimes that can be less. And so on average, it costs us about $1,400. And so, you know, one of our biggest challenges right now, um, as I, I know that you've probably all been informed in the news of, um, you know, Families First recently um, lost all their funding. And so they had to close due to the embezzlement that happened um, down in Jackson. Um, with uh, Department of Human Services. And so we've lost all the resources in them. And it's been really, really hard um, for us to try to find resources, um, you know, in Oxford. Um, you know, I will say when it comes to um, things like collecting needs for children, such as clothing or, um, you know, just various things from the community, people really, really gather around us and they are always willing to help. Um, but we've really struggled with resources in the Lafayette community. Um, you know, I, I know that there's some, you know, in surrounding counties, but we have to consider, you know, can, it, it, can they transport, can they get there? You know, not just children, but we are, we also are required to work with parents because the goal of the youth court is reunification. And so we're trying to work with these parents who might not have access to resources. And so we try to help them find those resources. And if they can't get there, then we're setting them up for failure. And so we've really struggled with resources. So whether that be parenting classes, um, you know, family therapy. Uh, we, we do work with Communicare really closely, um, but that, you know, and they're a great resource, but some other just um, free ones too that are out there that, that could be beneficial, helping parents find jobs, um, you know, play therapy for the younger children, um, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I would say uh, we've been very fortunate that we have not struggled during COVID. Um, you know, we have been able to interact with our children, be able to keep an eye on them, 
um, we had a national council has a hashtag during COVID that was um, hashtag eyes on kids. And so our volunteers have been very involved. We've hold, uh, we've held virtual visits with all of our kids, um, just making sure they're all doing well. And, you know, we have our teenagers that are, that are struggling. They struggle because they're not used to this life and they're not used to being inside. And then you get them into summer and they can't do anything. And so we, you know, trying to help, help them feel, comfortable in a place where they they feel like they have some freedom um, because otherwise I mean they're just sitting at home and and for teenagers and also adults um, you know sometimes it results in depression and so um, it's definitely something that that we have just tried to come up with ideas of how can we help these teenagers specifically um, you know really get through this time of um, boredom and loneliness and you know they're not at home they're in a foster home and so um, that's, that's really where we have kind of struggled as well, just trying to figure out what, what, what can we do for them, um, yeah. during this time. Well, building uh, a resource network from scratch is, is no easy task. And, and, you know, I love, I love your vision for making this a Northern Mississippi wide thing. And on the one hand, you could see how that would be a challenge, but on the other, you may have a wider resource network too. So strategically that could be really uh, smart over time. And, these challenges that you're talking about, I'm sure would be somewhat familiar to many of our nonprofit partners in terms of gathering those resources to support their clients. But I'd imagine there's also a lot of rewards you get from this work yeah. too, Aaron. And could you share maybe one or two of those that, that sort of brings this richness to your own life? Yeah. You know, um, I tell people a lot, you know, this isn't always sunshine and rainbows, but at the end of the day, it's so rewarding, you know, even, even if it takes a year to get that reward, um, you know, it's, there's nothing like getting, um, getting a video message from, from a child that you've been working with for a year and um, from their foster parent saying, Miss Ellen, I want to come see you. I miss you. And that, and that's, and that's how they say my name. So, um, you know, if there's nothing, and it really, cause you always wonder, you know, you wonder, you, you visit with these children, um, two-year-olds or even, you know, even my, my teenager that I, that I have, um, you know, you visit with them and you want to know if you're making an impact. You know, these are children that likely haven't had um, a mother figure, a father figure, or maybe even neither of the two. And so you want to be that that impact um, and you want them to know that, that it's OK to talk to them. It's OK to trust us. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's there's so many rewards to it. It is it is not this is not an easy job. And most would say, like, I don't know how you do it. And, you know, I tell people all the time, I said, I, I can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm okay with that because at the end of the day, I know what I'm doing is making an impact on these kids. And I know at the end of the day, when they turn 21, when they turn 25, or maybe when they turn 18, they're going to remember us. They're going to remember that volunteer that had an impact in their life. Um, and it, you know, I, I, I think about my job and I smile because it does, it's hard. There's some days where I'm, I mean, I, I, I've gotten in my car after a visit and I bawled my eyes out, but I've also cried happy tears. I've cried happy tears because mm -hmm. of the way that this community has been able to rally around um, a need that we had. Um, I'll give an example. Um, I guess it was about um, almost a month ago, we had two little kids that, little girls that just really, they didn't have anything. They came into a foster home, they had nothing. Um, they really needed some love. Um, and I, I, I simply put it on, on Facebook and on a Saturday morning, and within probably two hours, I had gotten $1,100 in donations via Venmo. Um, I had also had people that said, you know, that they were willing to go buy things for these children. And these to see the light in these children's eyes when I brought them the things that they have never seen before was just, it, it made it more than worth it. And I, I posted a picture later of, of all the things that I had gotten and just, just thanking the Oxford community. There's no way I can thank everybody. And that's one thing that, that does probably eat at me a little bit. I, I want to make sure everybody knows how appreciated, appreciated they are um, through this program. And then personally too. And I, I just, I just don't have enough time in the day to, to thank everyone. And so, you know, but without this community, we couldn't do the things that we do. You know, we couldn't serve the children that we serve. You know, even I don't care if you're giving a dollar. I don't care if you're giving me a hundred dollars a month, or if you're just giving your time, your time is as valuable as your money. And so it is, it's so important that we have the support that we have. And I, I tell people often, you know, there's a lot of CASA programs that are struggling across the United States. And I, I'm so lucky and I'm so blessed that this community has welcomed us with open arms and they have never looked back. And every day, I mean, I have people reaching out every day. Do y'all need this? Do you need that? 
And I always had to tell people no, but I mean, at some point, you know, you have to say, no, we don't need that right now. We don't have the space for it. And so, um, but man, it is just, I, I could go on for days just about the rewards of the job. Um, it's just, it's, it's amazing is what it is. And I mean, you know, but to, to be honest, we couldn't do it without our volunteers and they are the heartbeat of our organization. And without them, we really could not exist. We simply could not exist without them. Well, Aaron, your, your leadership, your passion is contagious. Um, I, I, I'm very confident in this short uh, uh, message that you're giving your audience that we know that the success is, more success is coming your way. How can the community contribute to your organization? What do you need specifically? I know you need, all organizations need money. Um, what, what do you need? Let's, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, call that shit for money. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we always, um, so there's, there's several things that you can do. So um, you can always contribute financially. We can do, you know, annual donations, recurring donations, um, one-time donations, and that all they have to do is simply just go to our website, which is um, www.costoflefayettecounty.com. And on there, there's a, a button that just says donate. And it's as simple as that. All deductions are, ta I mean, all donations are tax deductible. Um, you know, another, obviously, like I said, I mean, volunteer advocates are the heartbeat of our organization. And so we're always looking for people that are willing to give their time and their energy to be a volunteer advocate. Um, a lot of times people tell me that I don't have the time for it. And really the time, the most time consuming part is um, the training. And then after that, I mean, it's essentially, you know, you do things on your own time. Um, you know, there's obviously requirements, but you know, you still are able to be flexible. I mean, I have people that work full-time jobs. I have people that are parents. Um, I have people that, you know, don't have any jobs at all and um, are retired. I mean, there's a lot, I have a variety of people. And so anybody can be a volunteer. Anybody can step up for a child. And so, um, you know, we typically would hold um, three volunteer trainings a year um due to the, the situation that we're currently in we are going to hold our next one starting around september and so um there's still a lot of time for people to apply to be volunteers um because the thing is is once we expand we're going to need more volunteers i mean we we need more volunteers now i mean we we i, I have a volunteer class that's getting sworn in on tuesday and there's seven of them and every one of them are getting a case right away and so that might not always happen but right now we need them um you know, we need people to, to be able to advocate for these children. Um, and then aside from, you know, aside from being, donating, um, uh, being a volunteer advocate, you know, we always need people to volunteer at our events. Um, and then also um, something that I, I know people always want to give back and they want to figure out a way to give back rather than just giving up their, their funds um, or their time. And so um, we do something called Casa Christmas every year and we get every child that um, is in foster care or that has a, a, an open case with child protection services adopted for Christmas. We have them make a wish list and uh, we give them to um, a family, an organization, a business, an individual. And then they go and buy, you know, sometimes they buy everything on that wish list, sometimes they buy some of the things. And, you know, it's really a good way for people to feel, feel that sense of, um, of, I guess just like giving back and that you know they a lot of people which is interesting they do it for their children to see and say this is what you're doing for a child that doesn't have anything and so um, you know sometimes we'll have children just put on the list they need clothes or the, sometimes they'll put something as big as a playstation um, and so it's these children they go really big and they hope they might get something or they're just they're not used to getting anything and they just want something very simple and so that's another way that we can uh, that, that people can help too. Um, this past Christmas we served uh, 93 fam or 93 kids um, and so that's a lot that's a lot of kids and that means we need a lot of people to to be willing to you know adopt these kids um, for Christmas so that's something that we started our very first year and it was really successful and we did it this year and it was even more successful so okay. Oh, great. So as we start to wrap up, just one minute, final thoughts, what message would you most like to share with the uh, Lafayette Oxford community with everyone that's listening today? Yeah, um, I, I would say, you know, if you have a passion for children, or if you have a passion for helping others, this is definitely an organization you want to be a part of, um, you know, and it doesn't matter what that capacity is. Um, if you're looking for a way to give back, um, you know, let us know, we will find a way um, we are always looking and wanting um, wanting more people to be a part of this organization or to spread the awareness about um, what CASA does, spread the awareness about child abuse is present in this community every day. You need to be aware of it. You need to know what to look for. Um, and that that's something that people need to realize. Um, you know, we, we are constantly educating this community. 
and the people around us on what we do. But even more so, we need to educate them on what to look for for a child that is maybe is being abused or neglected. Um, you know, and I, I would just say, like, I, I simply couldn't do it without um, without the, the support of this community and things like this that, that that allow me to raise awareness about what we do and tell more about what CASA does. Because, again, I'm still educating everyone around us on what we do. And so I, I definitely appreciate y'all. Um, allowing me to to be on here with you and and answer your questions and um, just spread a little more cheer about what Casa's doing. It's it's a really exciting time. Um, you know, I, I I'm I'm excited. I love my job. I love what I do. Um, yeah, and I just can't wait to see you know how this this program continues to grow over the next few years. Wow, Aaron, your your passion for this work is an inspiration. Uh, I can say for us on this call, but I'm sure for all of our listeners and viewers out there and your dedication to this work um, is also an inspiration to us. You know, nothing just happens in terms of making the world a better place. People have to put their shoulder to the wheel. And your initiative, I think, is really a stunning example for so many folks who may care about something and think, what can I do? Well, I think you've shown what you can do and you're making a huge difference for the youth of our region. And so thank you for that. Thank you for being on the show today. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And to all of our viewers, thank you all for tuning in. Just a reminder that on this Friday, June 12th, we're going to have Zach Scruggs from Second Chance Mississippi. You do not want to miss Zach. He's doing some amazing work across the state. Uh, and so you'll want to tune in for that. In the meantime, please like, comment, and share this live feed with your friends. There are folks in LOU and across this country who need to know about the work that Aaron's doing. So please share this around. Stay engaged, stay safe, and we'll see you on Friday for Community Chats.